Greetings, darklings from across the interweb. It is once again I, the Duchess Precious Ken. I got a special uh, podcast for us today. Um, while we are going to be talking to a musician, and we might talk a little music, uh, this is going to be um, in his capacity as an artist and a uh, author that we're gonna be discussing for a new book coming up. So I'm really excited to get to that. Uh, before I do, as I always say here, um, if you send me stuff, then I will wear it on the show and talk about it. So today uh, I received uh, in the mail from my friend Craig Willers, DJ Dunord, uh, this cool t-shirt that he did. And you should go check out his streams. Um, I, I thought it was a really cool shirt. And um, just uh, best new, you know, goth that he spins, uh, a lot of electronic stuff and heavier stuff. So definitely go check out Craig and uh, his DJ stream. Now, without further ado, um, once again, edging out Dan Milligan uh, as the kind of like Saturday Night Live, I need to get a gold jacket or something as uh, my most had on the show guest. I bring back once again, Mr. Stephen Archer. Stephen, what's going on? So, so I have a question though about this. Um, people send you stuff and you wear it. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that guaranteed? I, you know, I have noticed some of your merch like has been like a very small hand towel or a banana hammock or something, I believe that I've witnessed before. So, um, but yeah, I'll stand by it. Yeah, if you send it to me, I will wear it. Okay, cool. Because I like because I was thinking more like non clothing items, like you know, <laughs> steaks or you know, um, yeah, or or a lovely uh, kerchief I could track. put on, you know, like uh, and maybe a bolo tie to go with it or something. Yeah, yeah well, obviously you want to accessorize that sort of thing, but uh, <laughs> you know, because that 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 ties the whole thing together. <laughs> well, so the uh, <laughs> Steven, I'm excited to have you on and we're going to get to talking about the book. I figure I'll do one other shout out here because we ran into each other uh, pretty recently when your amazing wife was doing yes. her book tour and I took my wife uh, to see it because she was very excited about Donna's book uh, for her birthday. So we went out to Smalls to see you there uh, with Steve Silver um, mm -hmm. and a great night. We had a, had a really good time. Donna just blew me away with some of the passion of her readings and the well, way she was doing stories there. Um, so although the tour is over, you can still go get uh, Donna's poetry book. Um, I highly recommend you do that. It, it's absolutely amazing. And I think one of the things Rachel hit me with that really got home to me is the way that Donna told these stories, which were all based uh, on, on real things, you know, I mean, real aspects of her life. And the way she told something that was so frightening, but not in a typical, like, gory, you know, monster movie kind of way scary her poems were, but the way they were psychologically real. And the reverence that she showed when she was kind of sharing and talking about these because they were people, you know, yeah. and, and that aspect of a, a true other part of horror where you're talking about the reflection of how life really is and, right. and, and the real horrors that in particular women face just walking around through their town at night. And, and stuff that, I don't know, maybe you and I don't think about all the time in the same way, but is just such a part of their lives. And I, I just watched on Rachel's face how much the impact of that, of kind of feeling heard, hearing Donna's poems really got through to her. And so I, I wanted to shout that out, uh, that out as well before we kind of get started talking about your book. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... Uh... She's an amazing writer. Um, the The current book is Girls from the County, and uh, you can find it on Amazon or uh, order it directly through the publisher. Um, and yeah, it's exactly it's exactly it. it's it's not scary because it's it's scary. It's it's, uh, it's scary because it's real. It's true. It's it's um, you know. And uh, no, she's a remarkable writer. 
Uh, are you um, looking over because she's hiding out off screen over there? I, I'm, no, I'm looking over because she's digging around doing something. I'm just making sure she's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, hold on just a second. Let me let All me right. pull her out. <laughs> No, he can edit it. Andy's back. Well, we back. got Steven there. All right. So we we just kind of, you know, talked for a second there about, uh, you know, hanging out at Donna's uh, book tour there and just where you can go find it. Um, it it's an amazing book, really, truly. I, I suggest everybody to go get it. And you got me, a, you gave me a painting. You had some of your paintings mm -hmm. that you had on tour then. And Colin uh, currently has it up where he's doing a little uh, surgery on it to get ready, oh, but I'll okay. have that on it. There's another example of uh, if you give me something, I will put it on the show and talk about it as well. So um, I want to move over now because, you know, you're always, whether it's doing stone burner in a different way, reading or doing music for audio books, you know, uh, you know, changing gears a lot, kind of expanding yourself into other medias as an artist. And I am a huge lover of graphic novels. I have a enormous collection there uh, behind me of quite a few of them. In particular, I really like trades. And rather than kind of getting the uh, hardcover, limited edition, put it in plastic version, I want the one I can hold and read. Yeah, you have to read it. They're all together in bound in the same one, though. That's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. And when I, you know, heard about you doing this and kind of taking this mythology that you've talked about um, with this kind of apocalyptic red wolf and and the poem and turning that into a, a graphic novel, I, I just I was blown away. I'm like, this is a perfect fixture of kind of the different art styles and parts of Stephen. Tell me a little bit about what that meant for you and how you drew this together into a reality. Okay, well, so, so I've got a degree in fine arts from Corcoran School of Art, which is sadly no longer, which sadly no longer exists. But when it did, it was one of the oldest uh, and, and very well esteemed uh, school in the country. Um, and one of the, one of the ways it was actually very, it was perfect for me for how I work uh, is that they don't teach art uh, the same way that, that many schools do, which is very much a, this is how you do the mechanics of it. This is how you paint this, this is how you paint this. Sure. Um, they're, they're what's called process oriented. And um, by which they mean and this actually is part of the reason I've got the, this process tattoo on my arm. So, um, so I actually have a degree from the Corcoran School of Art, which unfortunately no longer exists. Uh, it was one of the most well-renowned, uh, oldest schools in the country. Uh, and uh, one of the ways it was perfect for me personally is that most art schools are, are very much about teaching you how to paint the thing, to, to do this the thing. Uh, Corcoran uh, is very process oriented, which is part of the reasons I have this process tattoo on my arm, actually. And um, by which they mean that how you get to the final piece is sometimes uh, as important, if not more important than the final, pro the final product. It's the, sure. the process that it takes to get to. So, I was given a lot of um, kind of mental tools and and just uh, to 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 do that and and uh, just different ways of achieving that and the the uh, process to, you know from from nothing to this final book was actually fairly involved. Um, set the wayback machine for is the is the video still going through okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. so yeah. you set the Wayback Machine for like six years ago, and I just finished um, this tour for the first, well, not the first, but the first industrial stone burner record for Technology Implies Belligerence. Yeah. And I was thinking a lot about the performance of it and how 
what what do you want how do you want your performance to to come across to people on stage and i kept coming back to this idea of this kind of being on stage as this kind of ultimate apex predator and because you're, you're in this privileged position i literally get to scream at people which is really cool um and, and I, in the back of my head, I just kept picturing the uh, the werewolves from Cycle of the Werewolf. This is these big kind of hulking things, yeah. and I was like, I want I want it to feel like that the show to feel like that. And um, it, towards that end, I, I was like, Well, you know, if you're gonna do that, then the material has to sort of reflect it. And um, towards that end, I wrote this song for a Electronic Saviors record uh, mm -hmm. called. Uh, this is probably probably bullshit Latin, but it's uh, lupus invocat lupus, which is, uh, in theory, it's wolf calls to wolf. Though I'm not exactly sure if that's actually legit or not. And it's this really chaotic, chaotic song that that, that I felt like captured that idea. Um, so when you say real quick though that like wolf calls to wolf, you're kind of talking about like almost like these two apex per howling to each other kind of uh, across distance to communicate more like uh not, not quite that literally more like it's you put the thing out there and it, it it comes back you know to like minds and yeah 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 exactly um it's a play on uh uh it's a play on uh what was it uh crap um Essentially, the the I don't remember the, the Latin for it, but it's the void calls to the void. It's a, it's sure. a play on the concept. Um, so I did that, and I was like, "Well, that's cool," but uh, I needed to start thinking about okay, I need to put something out. I was in between record labels at the time, and the cool thing about that is that I can just put shit out and it goes out and it's done. I didn't have You're to deal with it. anybody. You just do what right. You want. Yeah, I can just there it goes. And I needed to get something out, and this was. Um, right before covid hit i started working on it and when i finished finished it it was early in that year um so it was kind of a really odd time period anyway um i will often start i i find that giving giving a, a, a putting a bottle pulling out a bottle and putting it down and saying okay this is the shape makes it a lot easier to fill in everything else so um, when I, I said to okay, I need to write this, I need a title for it. And I, you know, I was familiar with is this tennis. I don't remember who actually wrote the damn thing, but the poem, which, you know, the hook in it or one of the hooks in it is uh, nature, red and tooth and claw. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's perfect. That's exactly where I'm trying to get to with this. And so I did a little quick little artwork thing for it, said red and tooth and claw, I'll be selling this in two months, haven't recorded a song for it yet, here's pre-orders, go. And then I had to write material for it. Um, By the way, it's Tennyson. Ten that, that was, yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was going to say too, but I don't want to, I didn't want to be wrong, so I chose yeah. to plead ignorance. Um, and uh, right around that same time, I just did this, this digital painting of this gigantic wolf kind of looking down over some very, very small city and uh, just titled it The World Wolf Made Prints of It and put it up online. Yeah. And it was just kind of this normal looking guy. He hadn't, he hadn't uh, acquired his red coloring yet. Uh, but that image stayed with me. And uh, I started, you know, just really kind of thinking about that and trying to, pinned down I was like well, what's why is this happening what what's the story behind this and I just started playing with it more and more and, and kind of seeing this wolf just going nuts and destroying cities and, and which is great wonderful really cool image yeah um and but I um and I even got I think the first song the, the title track of Red and Tooth and Claw like I got that started before i really knew what was going on in the story and then one day i was like oh oh okay well he's he's angry because his his partner dies uh because she 
ends up drinking from this polluted river. All right, cool. And then develop this entire backstory, um, which uh, which we can go into. But then the the um, and as that kind of came together, then the EP turned into just a collection of vignettes uh, that center around those events. The 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 video for Red and Tooth and Claw, if you watch the very beginning of it, there's this whole instrumental section and it's drawings on a cave wall that kind of give a little bit of a narrative leading up to the events that are actually in the main part of the song, which is the, the wolf going crazy on everything. Um, and in yeah. the drawings on the cave, it was of whatever was left of humanity or whatnot, kind of document. No, no, no. It's uh, it's um, it's their history, basically. Oh. So, so the story, uh, the story essentially is. And since I this has been out for years, I don't actually feel bad about like breaking the whole thing down. But th the wolf is essentially. In the book, I refer to him. Uh, he is one of many uh, what we call the the uh, curators of the library of was, um, and his job. And there's there's many of these entities that are out in the in the universe, and each one has their own region of space. Um, and their job is to, at the end of every uh, every cycle of the universe. Uh, Basically, when you, once you get to heat death and the universe stops expanding, uh, is to go in and they have collected all of the stories and ideas from the, the things that live in that region. And then they take them all the way back to the center singularity uh, where they, they mate and the ideas all kind of merge and change and get morphed around. And then when the next big bang happens, they get blown back out. And that way, every uh, every cycle of the universe uh, is able to grow from whatever the last one was. They use that as the seed for the last one based on that information. So uh, it, the wolf's region is, uh, humans are really the best option for this. So his, there, there are others, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on kind of a side cool story. At one point they're talking, he's talking about looking off in the distance and seeing another one of his, his type and there are so many different beings in the region that their their shape the the shape of the the is is constantly shifting and morphing and falling out of itself because it's full of so many stories from so many different uh, worlds. But his shape is pretty much defined just by uh, by uh, the stories from from Earth and humans. Um, so uh, he his job then is to push humanity forward as much as he can. Uh, so at the beginning of every cycle, he, you know, he goes in and goes down to earth, does some other stuff, but he essentially kickstarts evolution and uh, then helps guide humans as quickly as he can get them up and running to, to be independent and take care of themselves. So that's great. And uh, so after that, um, at one point he is, so he just kind of walks the planet and is there and and the humans kind of follow, as he would say in the book, they, they, they follow along or they don't, you know, and sometimes they will climb up on him and build a little civilization, their little, little towns and things. Um, but they'll often just follow him in packs. And, and, and uh, at one point um, this she-wolf, uh, they've started domesticating the dogs or the, the, the canines and the she-wolf comes in and she runs up onto a little cliff so she can be even with him and basically just looks at him straight in the eye and she's like how is it with you wolf and he's like whoa this is not the way of things because because he's not he's never had anything at least in his memory ever looked at him as this singular entity as, as anything like other than this god thing yeah. this like a force of nature like you wouldn't like, like yeah, be like how's exactly. your day going today hurricane cool right yeah yeah exactly it's exactly what's like he's like whoa and I, I should also point out that this is the the wolf is very much me at my absolute most autistic um sure. so he's very he's very 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 smart 
and has absolutely no emotional intelligence whatsoever. Um, so he's he's like, this is how things are. This, you know, I understand how this is. And when things deviate from that, it gets very confused. And so he basically is just like, whoa, I don't know how to cope with it. And basically runs off. Um, so she follows him and uh, for a while longer and then just kind of disappears. And he just wants to, one day he notices she's gone. Uh, at this point, humans are basically doing fine on their own. So all he's doing is now just walking around the planet, just keeping an eye on stuff. And because he doesn't really fit into their mythology that much anymore, they just don't see him. Um, so he's just essentially kind of psychically collecting stories by just being near them and hearing stuff. Uh, and at one point, he's in uh, Mesoamerica, and he hears her crying off in the distance and so he just ends up running essentially across the entire planet to get over to to northern africa and um finds her uh she's grown to to be his size and he finds her uh in k in, in in a um like with walls to have been built up around her and she's been trapped she's been tied down and he just loses his mind and just destroys the entire encampment and, and sets her free uh, and uh, then helps her get cleaned up and uh, then they just walk the planet together I and mean, he's able to for the first time he's like well I, I you know is, is I think this is love I think that's what this is um, so they they do that for a while and eventually um, at the beginning of the last ice age they're like okay I'm gonna we're gonna take a nap so essentially they go to uh a, a den underneath the Rocky Mountains and uh, fall asleep. So that's the entire beginning portion of that video. It's essentially that. Uh, There's so the much to unpack song. there. <laughs> There's so much to unpack there. I mean, that's yeah. that's really amazing. But there's and and I love how uh, to me it ties to a lot of other I don't know primal myths. Right, because almost all of the primal myths, whether you're talking about, and then the sun found the moon, or right, yeah. Greek mythology, Roman mythology, all of you know where you started with Kronos, maybe, but then you know, mm -hmm. uh, I I think that's really interesting that it's kind of the beginning, and you could even say in a Kabbalah sense, or I mean, I guess Judeo Christian sense, and the idea that the the tree of life is split into a, a feminine and a masculine aspect, um, oh, really? but they are both kind of one of the same being. And it's just that humanity can't comprehend the vastness of that. So they have to find ways to compartmentalize the different aspects of godhood or whatever you, you want to say. So I, I love that more than anything else, this really ties back to a paleolithic origin story almost in my head you know yeah and, and there's there, there's actually um uh the la there, there's two dlc chapters that that you download with it and and the last one is actually a um, a magazine that is has it's called decade that gets published 10 years after the events of of uh what they call lupus summer um and uh, it gets into that. It gets into, uh, it, it's basically looking at you know, what was the socioeconomic impact of all, you know, basically having, you know, a third of the United States destroyed. Uh, how did people recover? Uh, what, you know, what do you, uh, what do the Catholics say? Because all of a sudden here you have an actual real God. Right. So how does that affect things? Um, how does, uh, you know how how does the rest of the world you know how does it affect the rest of the world socially how does it uh you know how did the government deal with it what were the plan like and so there's there's a breakdown of all the plans that they that the military created to to deal with the wolf there's the president's speech saying this is what we're doing about it um well even it makes me think too, yeah like people on a smaller level like there was a book i read quite a while ago um and it was kind of half tongue-in-cheek comedy but it was called towing jehovah and oh, yeah. really the premise oh you read it okay yeah, yeah. It, yeah. so the premise is yeah the uh god's giant <laughs> dead white guy body or whatever is floating in the ocean and 
But people, when they learn this, kind of like you said, the church lose their minds because there's mm-hmm. no, now that we've actually seen God, mm-hmm. is there any repercussion for our actions or right. was there ever, or, and, and that's where minds go with it. So I love you like spin out from a bigger, like economic level, but also just to individual humans have to think like, what is morality anymore? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and even more so, actually. So, so uh, picking up the story, um, they, you know, he wakes up and she's she's in the den and she's missing. Uh, he leaves it and eventually follows her trail uh, and finds that she is dying after drinking water from uh, this polluted river. And uh, it's very very sad, and he gets very upset, and he he. Uh, and he's like, and he he gets technology because he's done this, you know, however many cycles of the universe. So he understands that. But this is in his memory the first time this has ever happened. And uh, so he loses his shit and goes and destroys this massive, uh, um, like refinery facility, sure. and then picks her body up and takes it and and puts it on it and uses it as a pyre to to burn her body. Uh, goes back to the den, goes to sleep. Uh, he wakes up to her spirit kind of going, hey, hey, wake up, come on, let's go, come on, let's go. And so they go, they go running uh, and he's very, very sad and he misses her and all that. Uh, and he, she basically says to him, you know, maybe, maybe Chaos, chaos drives the world. Maybe you need to go and inflict some chaos on on this planet. Uh, he wakes up, and in this this chapter, chapter four, red and tooth and claw of a chapter, it begins actually. So th- this is the first chapter. It's not from his point of view. It begins with uh, the military have have set up this entire co- not compound, but entire like army outside of where his den is and they are like the okay defense contingency to like control right. this whatever right. kaiju force right exactly and um they uh they're like okay there's a laser tripwire the moment he hit you know he he, he breaks that uh, bunker buster missile is going to come in and we're going to be using all these uh dazzle lights to make him you know hopefully make him stop yeah and stay in one place before we do it and they're looking at the den and they're like, okay, this, this gives us a pretty good idea of how the entrance to them, like pretty good idea of how big he is. Uh, and he wakes up, he goes out it, and what the military doesn't realize that, is that he actually kind of comes down like this and, and comes out of the den. So like, he's about five times bigger than based on what they think it is. So uh yeah they're not too pleased by that eventually the, the, the he breaks the laser wire and the um missile ends up just hits him in the forehead i did the math on this and we we figured out that it was his skull is about 15 meters thick um and so a bunker buster isn't going to do anything against that and all it does is it pisses him off and it burns this kind of this chaos symbol right into his forehead which is where that comes from um so that section of the book is then him going, I don't actually remember this. I have pieced it together from memories that I have taken inside of me. And so that entire section of the book is written in these little vignettes of the people in, um, in across the country uh, as he attacks. And, and, and so they're just seen from all these different points of views of like, you know what they're experiencing as that happens i i love that ed like i don't need to get too trippy or anything on this but kind of like you said he is the stories of people Mm -hmm. and he is this entity as well that now is kind of i don't know taken on like a greek or roman god where there is a physical form that is here now too so at the same time these people are telling these stories they're actually feeding back into kind of what he is in totality because they're remembering him again. And and I love this idea of kind of the cyclical 
nature of his growth. Yeah, they, well, uh, here, here's one of the, the shorter ones. Um, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, I'll just read this real quick. Uh, changing the sign is nothing. She always has mar markers with her. Putting the thing symbol on her forehead is tricky without a mirror, but the building across the street has fancy windows and she can see herself just fine. She puts the piece of broken glass to her face and is done by the time security arrives. Walking back into the street, the onslaught of people knocks her down a few times, but that's nothing new. She's getting closer, and even though the crowd is thinning, the fires are burning and it's getting harder to breathe. The smell of barbecue is unmistakable. She sees it now. Visions swirl in her red mind. She imagines herself climbing up its leg and riding it into the city's destruction. She loves it and it loves her. It walks towards her in no hurry, like the largest thing on the planet. Uh, sorry. It wa walks towards her in no hurry. The largest thing on the planet need not rush, so she patiently waits. As it closes in, she calculates where its front paw will land and moves next to that spot. She loves it and it loves her. Oblivion comes fast. Her sign blows away in a whirlwind created by its wake, created in its wake. It's found on a low roof weeks later by looters from the country. They think it's hysterical. You know, so um, you just so there's just very different little vignettes that that um, yeah. happen in there. There's a there's a part about a serial killer. There's there's all kinds of just other stories, um, and then. Eventually, the wolf gets uh, like he can't kill the thing. He kind of gets knocked out, and Cyan, his partner, comes to him and goes, essentially, shows him what his life is like. It would be have been like if he was a human, and how you know, just as a way of trying to like help him relate. Process. Yeah, and uh, and she's like, okay, well, here's the thing, and she tells him a story about how you know back uh, primitive humans they they there was this this time where they uh, moved into an area where a lion was and then the lion, they went to try and hunt it and the lion killed most of their, their tribe. Uh, but the ones that survived told stories and sang songs about this experience. And then the next time that that happened, they were able to kill the lion with much less loss. Basically how- uh, From passing uh, down that uh, yeah, spoken word- stories even though it was future generations, they all uh, grew from the wisdom of it. Right. Yeah. Stories give form and, and teach. And he was like, and, and she basically was like, look, so, you know, you, you've done this now. You've, 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 you know, been angry. You've, you've enacted all this vengeance. Um, it hasn't brought me back. And now you're kind of working counter to the entire reason you exist. You're, you're trying to drive these humans and trying to develop them. Well, that's cool, but uh, you're, you're you're working against this now, so you need to figure out a way to get out and stop this, so that they can continue on this path. Um, so she basically says, "You you have to let them kill you. You have to let them. You have to be that. You know, you have to give them a reason to. You can't just disappear because that'll be confusing. So you have to actually just let them kill you." And he's like, "Well, fine, but I'm not going down without a fight." And so they spent a couple of months trying to kill him. And uh, eventually they get him pretty close to death. And he's dying next to this, this big ravine. And um, as, as, uh, as he's dying, she's like, okay, well, here we are. You know, you, you've done it. Everything's, you know, you, you bottled everything up. Uh, now it's time for you to die. It's time for you to go. Um, and uh, when, my publisher wrote me at one point and she was like, did, did you mean I'll leave two black pages just right in the middle of the book? I'm like, yes, yes I did. Um, you turn those pages and she's like, really? I'm, I'm kind of disappointed in you. Um, let, me, let me see if I can find the page. Uh, Cause it's, uh, it's one of those, those moments that I think sums up her character pretty well. Wake up, Wolf, she says. My eyes shoot open in a combination of wonder and confusion. You, you forgot, didn't you? I whine. You're a creature of cycles, Wolf. You pass from the cold of the void through the birth of universes, and you thought this would be your end? 
you thought you could end? I'm kind of disappointed in you. Do you really believe that the wolf of this region actually has a body that can be killed? Could that body survive the heat at heat death again and again and again? There's matter and energy and gravity and you and I, we are love. She smiles at me in the way of wolves, looks from me to the sky, it looks to me from the sky and back and says, let's run. And then they go off into the universe. Um, so it, I was, I'm just was very pleased to be able to tie the whole story up. And, and that was actually, you know, there's a, the last song, the or, or was originally the last song on the EP, Unsympathetic Magic tells that part of the story. And there's a video that goes along with that. Um, and then there's two other chapters in there. The, the one of them, like I said, is that magazine which breaks everything down, yeah. and then the other one is uh, is called The King of Wolves. And what that does is it's it, instead of being like the graphic novel, it's just kind of an story with some illustrations in it. And that basically connects this story with the character that's on Apex Predator and kind of goes into some of that stuff. So if I ever write that down, there's the the segue chapter exists as a uh, a way to get into it. But, um, and then re-releasing the EP that went along with all of this stuff in the first place, I actually wrote a new song that is basically from a Cyan's point of view, that part of that story. Um, it's the beginning, the beginning half of the song is her kind of talking him through the experience of dying and then coming out of it. Um, so this whole thing, I'll tell you, really puts me in mind of the, the spiral chaotic nature of a narrative that isn't alan moore okay probably quite possibly the greatest graphic novel artist arguably of all time um you know i i think that's you know pretty fair did one of my favorite quotes because he's pretty famously known for hating even though there's been several of them people making his graphic novels into movies yeah. and and one of my favorite quotes from him is he says, it's not that I hate films or even hate superhero films. They're just, they don't work well with the whole point of a graphic novel. When you go in and watch a movie, you hit play and you watch the movie in chronological sequence until it reaches the conclusion of the narrative. But you don't go to the movie theater and you can't hit pause and rewind and, and go back when you're sitting there watching it. Now, I guess we can, you know, these days with like streaming and whatnot, but, but that was his point at the time. He said, when you're reading a graphic novel, the most beautiful thing in the world is there's a detail on page three that you don't realize the importance of until page 36. And you learn something on page 36, which clicks in your head and you flip back to page three and see one tiny detail that was in one panel mm -hmm. and a new idea surfaces in your head. And that's the art form of a graphic novel. So when I really hear you talk about this story, that's what I hear you really embracing and not even just from the graphic novel we're talking about, but in the sequence of songs, which were released in different orders as you went through it. Um, in the sequence of, you know, you having, I'm sure, paintings or art that goes mm -hmm. back to what you said with the tattoo. It's not about where you end up, just all of these things are part of the process. And you don't even know right now every part of that process that's yet to unfold. Oh, sure, so it's yeah. just as much in a lot of ways a mystery to you as it is to the people reading and going through it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely, you know, you're learning about it uh, as as a, learning the story as you're developing it. I, and there are there are things that that like. There, there, there is at the very beginning, there is a reference to something. Uh, later on, you know, that 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 if you're if you blink, you'll miss it. But, sure. uh, you know, if you read it a couple of times, it may make, you know, it may make sense to you. And I think it's a pretty cool cool little nod um but like so one of the things that, that, that I, so i'm writing a side cool to it which is a, the same story but it's from cyan's point of view um 
and I'm doing it much more as like a novella instead of an illustrated book. Yeah. Uh, we'll see, maybe that will change. But um, right now, that's how I'm doing it. And because one of the things about the story that I think is really important is that Wolf Red has a job. You know, he, he's a curator. This is, you know, he's got this reason to exist in the universe. Sure. Cyan doesn't, and or didn't. Um, and that bugged me because I didn't want her to just be be Red's girlfriend. Like, like she right. she's she's clearly very intelligent and. Um, oh, and she defined him in a lot of ways. I mean, the right, way I yeah. hear you talk about it he didn't really have a consciousness in any kind of a personal way until he had her as a foil to give him yeah. that perspective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he because he does a lot of thinking about the concept of I and, and you know, you wondering about if the other curators are aware of themselves in that sort of way. And, uh, and Galactus does what Galactus must in order to survive, but there's no yeah, yeah, well, that. yeah, very, very much so. Um, and uh, so I wanted to, to. She, she needed to also be a naturally occurring thing. And one of the things that, that like I said, they, they, they both have a very selective memory, so uh, which helps them stay focused on the the important job of whatever the thing is. Uh, and one of the things that the, and this isn't at all explained in the book, but uh, is explained in the other one, uh, is that this happens every time, but uh, he doesn't remember it. Um, and, uh, and neither does she. Like they just, they're both these forces of nature and her, and I, I had to really figure out what, why she would exist at all what, what her role in this in the universe the, that whole cycle is and eventually i came up with a reason that works well enough which is based, it's like it's not as elegant as i would like but it still works uh that there is often uh, you know he he brings all of these stories and all that stuff but there is often matter still left in the universe uh, after heat death and her job is basically just to run around and knock it into the black holes you know, some of the smaller pieces that cannot, like, that don't just automatically aren't big enough to, to just fall into those those uh, gravity wells as they're created by the stars going out. Her job is to then go and knock any remaining stuff into it. And so You're gonna she's make her a clean up after him? Hmm? <laughs> She has to clean up after him? <laughs> Not after him, but, you know, she's part of the cleaning up the universe. Right. So it has the material to to start back up. Sure. Like the idea, you know, uh, antimatter and matter, uh, entropy, you know, the idea that, yeah, I mean, there has to be a, a nothing before a rebirth. Right, exactly. So she's basically just making sure all that. And that's one of the many that do, does that. Um, but like once you know once he arrives on earth he doesn't actually remember how he got there like in his mind he's just always been there um so there are just these points where that those memories get cut off so he isn't really focusing too much on anything else so that kind of allows him to not remember that she has existed before um but then it just then I had to, to figure out how it is she goes from just being a, this regular sized wolf to to getting huge and and because she doesn't remember like basically she spends the first part of the story just kind of going I don't know why I'm not dead like I'm wandering around I don't really fit in with any of these other wolf packs I was here before the wolves were here. Um, and I don't understand why. And so eventually, like she, she hears these stories about this this giant wolf, and um, goes and and finds these other normal wolf elders, and they figure out they they have this kind of ritual uh, to create like this weird compass at the table to like point to where he is, so she can go find him um and eventually she she does and then she leaves and goes through this other this whole experience where she she goes into a a cave and sees 
her part in the universe. Like she sees the universe in a much bigger. Uh, but yeah, you know, I just finished reading uh, it again for the first time, and or not for the first reading it again yeah. for the first time in a long time. And um, there's a section in it where they have a, they all go into a to a, a, a smokehouse, uh, a sweat lodge, and have this kind of group hallucination of the origin of, of it, how it gets to the planet. And basically it's the same sort of thing. She goes into this cave and has this experience where she's able to understand how, yeah, how an epiphany works. of. Yeah. Of and, uh, and when she comes out, she's, you know, giant again. Uh, and she's kind of like, Oh, okay. This is, this is what I do. This is, this is who I am. Um, and, uh, and I had to figure out why she gets caught. Like, what, what, why are people? Why did the, the, you know, what did they? What was their motivation? And I actually did. I found out. I figured that one out too. I was like, oh, the, these Egyptians think that she is a very specific god, and they want to win the war, so they assume that if they can get capture her, then they can use that as a. So, um, that's a whole thing that I'm still in the middle of writing but but all of these elements are I, I have to figure out answers to them and but I, I don't have a real wiggle room like I know these are the events that happen in the book in, in, the, in the graphic novel and I have to figure out how to make these other things fit into that without changing this stuff yeah <coughs> so I mean I that is another hard part kind of like we talked about the Alan Moore thing is right. your your narrative has to fit itself Right. You know? Yeah. So if you put something down, uh, you know, to ink already, drew an image there back on page three, that has to always remain true. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that shit. Honestly, like I, I really like. I, I'm a huge believer in in uh, limitations, forcing you to be creative. You know, like when when we yeah. first started doing music, you know, we were working with a four track and and you know, just a few pieces of gear and, and we had to learn the gear and you had to learn to really get like a test it. pilot, be able to to push it to its absolute limits and yeah. what its limits were because that was as much as that piece of gear that the technology you had at the time could do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And sometimes you have to like, you know, you know even with all this shit back here, you know, like I'm doing a lot of like really esoteric routing things in order to make you know splits and merges and all this stuff in order to get it to to the sound to go the way i want it to go so i can interact with it the way i want to interact with it um so i yeah i'm a, I'm a really big fan of, of uh being forced to to work with within own your own rules yeah yeah story yeah i mean yeah, I, 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 I love that too. And I, I think that's so important. And sometimes I think gets lost in the modern day on oh. books because things become, even in music, so singles over albums and concepts, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and rather than really making things tie together and like you said, putting yourself on that chain to a point, but at the end of the day, when you look at the thing as a whole, it has so much more depth and so much more form when you do that than when you just, I don't know, like in comic books often, how many times do you see Marvel or DC or Image has been retconned over the years where they just paint themselves into a corner by their own rules and they're like, yeah, but we don't want to do that anymore. So now we have to make up some excuse of mm -hmm. why that thing that was always true before doesn't exist anymore. And now, I don't know, Batman can kill a guy or something. You know, like we right. established this rule, but now we want to change it. And right. so we make Husk, you know, or, you know, something like that. So, no, I, I love that idea too. And I think to your point, it really does force you to sharpen your art. Mm -hmm. oh, like to to not settle for well yeah okay well I guess this this piece fits no like if you really want it to wow somebody to 
uh, you know, when I was uh, interviewing uh, Raymond uh, the other day, he kind of talked about his new track, Dumb Dumb Bullet, and that idea of, you know, the bullet going into your head, but it doesn't explode and fracturize until it gets in there. Mm -hmm. That's what makes people hearing your art or seeing your art have that kind of moment is when you force yourself to do something very, very difficult within your own constraints. Mm 